Hello and welcome to Berlinale 21, um, to the Teddy Talks, to Directors Exchange here. My name is Christian Peterson and I'm happy being here, but I'm not very happy being alone, I have to say. I am physically, at least, I'm, I'm not alone. Um, we want to talk about our role in writing queer history and I'm very, very happy having um, at least um, via Zoom online um, here Melissa Tomovic, um, Elian Rahep and Monika Treut. Um, I watched all your films. I think you also watched your films and um, we have one and a half hour. I have to admit that I don't really like those formats but nobody can change it um, and I mentioned already how how I miss the smell of the smoke in my clothes after having smoked 1,000 cigarettes with you, Monica, in the Panorama reception. But I hope we will do that in the future, in the near future. And in June, I hope we will see each other anyhow. Um, um, we have one and a half hours, as I said, and please, the audience, you can also have some questions. You can write your questions and they will give them to me whenever you have a question to the three protagonists here, the three people I'm going to have a talk with, please feel free to write them. And first of all, I think it would be good to just introduce my panelists. And I would like to start with Monika Treut, even though I think I really don't have to introduce her. Uh, Monika Treut is a frequent guest in our festival. Um, and her first film was 85. I was too young to watch this, uh, um, Seduction, The Cruel Woman, that you wrote also your PhD about. But 89, you came up with um, Virgin Machine, and that was really a film that had a big, big influence on me. I watched it, and it was actually the first time that I read the credits and thought like, oh my God, who made this? And who did the camera? I was really, really impressed by the film. Um, I was sweet 19 years old back, back then. You had another film, um, My Father is Coming, and many, many other films, also documentary films, Zona Norci, and, um, and, but um, Female Misbehavior was a film where you collected some um, short films. It was kind of like a compilation of short films. And you portrayed, for example, Camille Paglia in an interview, which was incredibly funny. And also Max. And I think Max was also one of your protagonists in Gender Nords. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and Gender Nords leads us to the film that you have this year in the program, Generations. And I would like to show a short um, trailer of this film so that we get an idea about the visual approach. Please start the trailer now of Generations. I like to say it's the most normal thing about me is my transition. More than 20 years ago, I spent a lot of time in San Francisco. There, I shot the film Gender Knots with and about the pioneers who were on a journey through shifting identities. Now, I'm visiting my protagonists again. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a man. Everybody who meets me just takes me as a man. I, I live my life as a man 24-7. I'm, I am a man. At some point, you really feel like it's happened. When I was in transition, I thought it was interesting to ask the question, what is my sexuality likely to be like later? And I had no idea. And I thought about it and I decided I didn't care. <laughs> because once they know you, once they like you, and they see that you're basically just the same as them, sort of a little guerrilla marketing for trans people. I call San Francisco the clitoris of the United States. It's very tiny. It is surrounded by water. It's very electric. It's become a lot whiter and a lot wealthier. Um, so many of my friends feel like they can't afford to live here anymore. People oh, I would never be able to afford to buy a house yeah. here. So this has been a real sanctuary for a lot of artists. We have dinner parties, so it is kind of a Sprinkle Stevens salon. Some people never give up searching. They never give up adventuring, questioning. That's a journey that they take all their lives. And they are always going to be gender knots. Yes, I think that, yeah, Monica, you want to say something? 
Uh, yes, I think it was a bit funky the way it played. Huh? So the music didn't really make it uh, with the images. But uh, yeah, one reason more to watch the film live, of course, in June. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's an incredible incredible film. I was very happy watching this and also writing the text. And we spoke about it already, and we will do also now. Um, but in the year you made Gender Nauts, um, it was when you, Elian, founded Beirut DC, 99. Um, and we also want to talk about Beirut DC later, but 2013 you um, made the film Sleepless Nights. And I have to quote someone, it was in Variety, about the film. It says, it's hard to find a Lebanese film that doesn't focus on the bloody civil war, and yet it is even harder to find a film that treats this topic better than Sleepless Nights. So that made me very curious. Unfortunately, I couldn't watch the film, but, but I hope you will send me a, screener or a screening link later. Um, sure. um, I also want to show a short scene of the film that I also liked a lot when I watched it the first time. It's kind of like a laboratory, um, and you try to dissect um, a life of your protagonist. Let's have a look in your film, Miguel's War. Bionic man, B major. I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm فينا نطلب منك تفلوت شعرك؟ أرغب شمال يما يمين على الملتين وهوب يسوع يسوع في عندي عباية جوا عباية Yeah, I think this film also gives a good idea or like an insight into the visual approach. It's super multi-layered. You work with different art forms and that makes the film very, very interesting and, um, and visually really interesting. Um, and I'm very happy talking to you um, about this film later as well. And then Milica, uh, Milica you studied um, dramatic arts in Belgrade and graduated with the film October, which is a compilation film, right? Or like an omnibus film. Yeah, yeah. And that's true. And 2016, you made this film transition and um, thanks for having sent me a link. Um, it was interesting to watch the film because it made me understand a bit better your ability in creating interviews and 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 nonverbal interactions it's and that leads also to kelty um where you portray um a group of people in a incredible way and let's have a look on your film as well a little scene desi pošto se setom ma treba mi samo na dan čerkici rođendan Mojoj mlađoj, vraćam ga odmah sutra. Pozdravi ženu. Hoću, hvala. Mogla bi malo više računa da povedeš o ženi. Beli, tri pute nedeljno vodi računa o meni. Minimum. So you made a film about the past, so your film is set in 93. Um, Eliane, you go back to the past of your protagonist, and Monica, you compare the past with uh, with uh, with now. Um, so we have three different approaches and three different um, options to talk about um, queer history. But how far are we aware, anyhow, to to be part of the queer history? That would be my first question. Maybe starting with you, Monica. Um, 
are you aware about being a chronologist of queer history when you plan your films already or is it during shooting is it at the premiere or 10 years after or is it just on on a panel when it's stupid questions arise like that well i guess uh, while i'm shooting the film i'm focused on making the film so i'm not really thinking about um history or so right um but uh i guess when the film is shown to uh to an audience uh as a filmmaker you really feel the interaction and you feel the response of the audience that's what we are missing so much right now um then i think you can as a filmmaker you see um whether the film really hits the spot whether it uh, can be uh, eaten up by an audience plus when you show the film again and again which happened actually with gender knots it's still shown and I was lucky enough to be at um, several screenings, um, then you feel the reaction. I had, for example, reactions by uh, parents of trans kids and who really um, were moved by the film. And then in the long run, I guess you can see that it yeah, did change the perception of trans people also for kind of a straight audience. You know, so it gender gen, gender knots actually had a crossover potential, and I was very, very happy about that in particular as well. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, Eliane, how was it in your production process? I can imagine it was quite long because you must have had so much material um, because it is so multi-layered. How long was your research process, and have you been aware about being a chronologists of queer history already by then. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts in terms of um, being a chronologist. Yeah. Uh, the, the shooting was not that long. Uh, in fact, we just shot, if I count them, maybe uh, 12 days, mm -hmm. but they were spread over uh, two years. Uh, and this is because uh, one, uh, we didn't have the budget when we started, so we have to make some uh, shooting just to convince. And uh, also because uh, Miguel lives in Spain and I live in Lebanon and I always have to bring him to Lebanon or I have to travel to Spain. So it's not like very easy to set up all this. Uh, but the the... The, the long process was, of course, first researching and then after uh, shooting a bit and then convincing the fund, uh, the funds and then shooting real, the, the real shooting, uh, which is longer than the first shooting in Lebanon and then shooting in Barcelona. Um, so uh, all, all, all over, maybe it took uh, three years. Uh, but well, last year I don't I don't count last year. Last year is not counted for anyone, I think, <laughs> because uh, we we lost one year, you know, in the houses. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's it's maybe three years all over. Um, but uh, I didn't think at that time that I was writing uh, queer history, as you say, because uh, first of all. Uh, the story of Miguel interested me, be, not because it's a queer story, uh, but because it's a multi-layered story about identity. Uh, and uh, uh, sexual identity comes as one of the identities of, of Miguel. Uh, but uh, for me, this complex uh, character with all his layers became a metaphor for me. For, for many things which we are trapped in here in this part of the, of, uh, of the world, which is how family, religion, and politics uh, uh, can mess up with your life and uh, uh, make you unable to live your individuality. And the individuality of Miguel was also being gay. So uh, 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 he was trapped in all this system in, in these three powers, which were family, religion, and uh, poli politics, 
uh, and unable to, to, to live as, as an individual having this sexual identity also. Um, uh, so this is uh, the, the, the thing that I really liked in, in Miguel's uh, story. Uh, and uh, I feel also that everyone in, 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 in this part of the world, but also in the world, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who does not fit, who does not fit in the system, is a queer person. So in this sense, uh, me, I am a queer person without having to deal with my sexual identity, but because I do not fit the system of being a, a, a woman, an independent woman in this part of the world without being married or without being uh, saying the things that I should say to, to be politically correct, uh, it's not only me, it's many people. So we have this double life of being, you know, in society something but if we want to live our individuality we live it underground or out, outside when we travel we, we are sometimes a total different person i am a different person when i am in berlin than when, when i am here because here i have to fit the society not shocking them being you know like uh in the mainstream or i have to be in war all the time which, I mean, it's, it's already very difficult to live here in this part of the region because of the wars that we live on the political aspect. So I have to also live a war with my individuality to affirm it and not to be ashamed of being uh, uh, outside the system. Uh, so uh, in this sense, it is a queer film, of course, uh, uh, but I did not think about it only as a queer film when I was uh, uh, doing it, I was thinking how uh, your body becomes a political response also to everything you don't like. Uh, uh, how you can deal with your individuality and do do all these wars to be who, who you want to be. Um, so, so in this sense, yes, of course, uh, maybe this film is uh, the first one to be that much daring and will, will saying things in a blunt way. Uh, because Miguel had the freedom to, 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 to liberate himself from this system that is here in the region and he can say all these things uh, very uh, without any censorship. And I really wanted him to be like this in the film, saying all the things without any censorship. In this sense, it will be maybe a, a, a unique film that has been made in this region that says things in this very frank way. Mm -hmm. Of course, like every film, every art piece we produce will become history later. How was it with you, Milica, um, when you started researching on your film? I mean, it's, it's set in 93. Um, you want to show that there were like some queer encounters as well. Um, how important was that for you to implement this in your film? And how important was it also to show that those encounters, sexual encounters, also anonymous sexual encounters, happened in those days in 93? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Oh, wait, wait, I have to remember how it all started. So well, when I started to write, uh, I wanted to, I don't know, it was a bit uh, autobiographical because it was uh, sensed on my, no sensed, that's not the right word. word. It was inspired uh, by my birthday I had like when I was eight. So, uh, firstly, I wanted to make uh, a film about the birthday party that uh, gone wrong. And in one part, there are kids, and the other part, there are uh, grown ups. The interesting thing why I chose 1993 because I think I celebrated birthday then, and uh, our country was under embargo, so we had sanctions. It was a bit, uh, everybody was poor, and that was interesting also. And uh, regarding uh, Gay characters, uh, it happened because I knew, uh, because of their, like, couple dynamics, you know. I, I imagined a couple dynamics that would come into this birthday party and would kind of take, take a part, part of space of the main character, of uh, the mother who was preparing this party, and they take space in form of uh, with their own dramas that they bring bring with each other. So that's how, for example, uh, I knew I'm going to have like um, 
how do you say um uh, uh tri tri love love triangle between uh, three women and i knew that uh, i'm gonna have a, a gay couple that is in a okay relationship that one is going to be the entertainer and the other one is going to be a grown-up in that relationship i like that and this, this is the things that i knew i wanted in my script and um, and then afterwards i i started to, to research and to read some books and uh, i found uh, because i everybody would ask me okay but uh, gay couples uh, who would um, act like that in a birthday party i was like but it was a cluster it's 1993 it's okay of course i mean i can imagine i can imagine that it, it it was really okay if you have a gay brother of course you're gonna have uh, the same company there right so then because i wanted to be sure and to give like a, i don't know to have proof of uh, uh, gay life in Belgrade in 1993. I, I found a book that is called Staklenac, which is about a guy who was cruising in Belgrade from the 80s to the late of 90s. So and that and that book was really, really good. And so it was a part of research. I, of course, I did a lot of research in the art that was there in the 1993, which was very important for me. It was uh, a bit inspiring for some painters I, I liked. Uh, you don't see that in a movie, but it was important for me. And also, of course, uh, the political scene, uh, production design, we, we talked a lot. We, we, I mean, our houses were the same from the 90s till the beginning of 2000. So we all remember what we had in our, you know, rooms and I, did I go too far with this question? No, 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 no. This is already kind of like leading me to the question to you, actually, because you really had to research about certain topics. You mentioned the book, which I think is very interesting. Maybe you can give me the title later. But yeah, yeah. also you have to recur on your own memory, right? You were like eight years old. Um, like um, you had to kind of like fish in your own visual memory. Um, yeah, yeah. But where else did you research about the rooms, the dresses, the way of communicating, the way Ninja Turtles, of course, you know, like that was probably your your icons as well. But how did you research? Because that would also lead us to a global question about the use of archives as well. Did you visit archives as well? Or tell us a little bit about your, your historical research. Well, uh, no, I, I mean, I watched, uh, I watched some movies from that period of time. Uh, I watched a lot of our, actually, photo albums. So my set product, so, so my produ production designer and my costume designer, we, we had these uh, like meetings where we went through our photo albums and we would do, and we would remember. And then because um, we are, uh, we all, we all are in, I mean, no, I'm not going to say that. So uh, we would all talk about it, what was from what, which, uh, which kind of um, uh, a particular thing was from what decade, for example, in a, in a living room, the, the, the tapestry, the, 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 the commodas and, you know, everything we were talking about. Okay, so this, this everything that we watched on our photo albums is like from the 80s when our parents, uh, our grandparents also had money and they, they wanted to renew their apartments. So we talked what was from the 80s, what was from the 70s, and what is now from the 90s, what, what, we, in, what we took that it's going to be in this house. And also was with the, with the clothing. Most of the clothing was uh, actually on the parents are, and, and their generation is from kind of late 80s but at teenagers and little kids you can see like um, uh, costumes that that are from the beginning of 90s and these are some uh, details that we were going to and regarding archives I, I don't think we went to it but we went to some of our old for example music uh, papers we had 
you know, like magazines. Because we all, uh, we, my older sister was uh, collecting it. So I went to the basement and took that out. So we, we had uh, that. And um, I don't know, I think, and yes, of course. And I, I remembered everything that I could from, the, from when I was a kid. And then, you know, when you start to remember things, then you kind of get in tune that you some, somehow uh, things just come to you, some some slang that we used back then that was interesting. And also in books. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I read a lot of books also uh, from that time and about that time. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry if I wasn't... No, no, thanks. Thanks, thanks. Point. Monica, maybe to you, I mean, like, you did not really have to research in, um, in archives because your film 20 years ago was your archive but um, back then, like, how did you use archives or how did you do your research um, before? Do you remember? Um, of course, I was reading a lot um, as well. And I was reading about, um, <clears throat> you know, transsexual politics, transgender politics. But uh, I guess the most um, important source were the people themselves. So uh, my research process for these two documentaries was mostly to get close to the protagonists and talk to them a great deal and feel out how they live, what, what are their problems these days, what is the, the situation they're living in, and also to establish trust, because especially in documentaries, the main, the most important a thing is to have um, a trustful relationship to your protagonist so they feel protected and they they don't feel exploited they don't feel you know they feel that you have respect as a filmmaker um, you know I mean that's that was my research material mm-hmm. thanks for mentioning this because um, coming to you Elian respect and trust of course is one of the main things you had to gain also from your protagonist and in your case of course you had to research you had like some f- archive material in the film but in your case the archive is Miguel himself it's and you know uh, memory is tricky when it comes to history you know because memory doesn't necessarily have to coincide with um, historical facts how did you deal with his kind of like colportage or like with his memory that might be shifted somehow? Do you think that it has to be also a topic of your self-reflection or as a filmmaker that you deal with those insecure, super subjective points of view? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I, of course, my main research was around Miguel himself. Uh, but uh, because I wanted to link his personal story to the bigger story. So uh, I had to put him in context all the time uh, so that it's not like a, a whole movie, like I'm doing a film about uh, just a person because I like him or, or he is a friend. No, I just wanted him to become really a metaphor of uh, periods that we live and that uh, other people would recognize them. So uh, the 80s and the 70s in Lebanon, I know them well because, uh, first of all, I lived them. I did not leave Lebanon during the civil war, Uh, especially the 80s. I know it very well. Uh, It really marked my my adolescence. Um, uh, But but, but of course, I I started being interested in uh, what what happened in Lebanon during the 80s before when I did a previous film about the civil war. So I was uh, already connected to the uh, political aspect of that period. Uh, to the, uh, concerning the family aspect of that period, uh, I know it also a bit because, uh, I mean, we have patterns uh, in our collective uh, 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 be, uh, be, uh, behavior in this country, which is uh, linked to really uh, how how uh, family, religion, and state come together, and then um, they become a big logo. 
uh, so so well, I know it also. I know uh, uh, these patterns, and I know many people who live the same things that Miguel lived. But uh, of course, another personal stories. But the bigger context, I know it well. Uh, but I had to research really details about his life. And I had to know more about the Spanish part, uh, which is uh, Movida years, uh, post-Franco years. And uh, for that also, of course, Almodovar is a big reference uh, in his films. But also, uh, Miguel took me to places in Madrid, which were uh, iconic uh, uh, at that moment. But of course, what uh, I found interesting in Monica's film is that uh, uh, today the people don't recognize the places, the iconic places, or the you know the trends that were linked to a certain period. Uh, the, the same thing happened when Miguel took me to places or nightclubs or even the parks of Madrid that used to be uh, very uh, related to uh, the Movida years or the, liber the Liberty years. Uh, 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 there was nothing left out of them. Uh, uh, some became malls or some became, you know, and the, the sad thing is that now all this uh, life became with the apps. I mean, now the apps replaced the personal contact that uh, uh, anyone would do to uh, flirt with somebody or to meet someone uh, in, a, in, a, in a place which is like underground place. Now it became a bit of banal. So this is why, for example, in my film, I did not find a place for Madrid because there's nothing left of Madrid to show it. So I replaced it by animations, for example. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, talking about uh, the, the, the research, it's, it's very, very important uh, in, the, in the films, uh, especially when you're talking about somebody, uh, his life, to, to be honest with, with, with his life. Uh, and uh, what, for me, the biggest uh, worry was, uh, will Miguel love the film? Uh, will he find, uh, find it ethical? Although it's an unethical film in the sense that we are really, uh, the taboos are all, you know, like we are uh, putting them, you know, we are deconstructing all the mainstream. We are really playing with all this belief but uh, with him, I wanted to be ethical. Like, uh, really, even if he does not remember well, uh, uh, the memory and the fantasy, sometimes they are very much linked. The denial, because also like being traumatized when you are a kid, you enter in a denial phase. And him away, exiled in Madrid, he was totally in denial with Lebanon. Uh, when you deny your identity, so you create another identity to survive sometimes. Uh, so uh, all this came in the film and we are talking about it and we are analyzing and uh, we are uh, trying to understand what happened. Was it a total fantasy or it really happened? So we are playing with, with, with memory in, in this sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that for me the reward was that Miguel liked what he saw and he felt it was an honest film because it reflected also the, inca the, the incapacity sometimes to make a film about something which is much bigger. So mm -hmm. it's fragile in a sense. The film also is fragile. We don't have all the answers. We are not, we are living this experience together of going back in the past and trying to uh, uh, deconstruct the traumas of Miguel and trying to find answers. Mm -hmm. uh, so all this, I'm exposing the audience to it. Hopefully mm -hmm. also like everyone will reflect about this. It becomes really a film for everyone to reflect about life, trauma, war, love, family. All this is in the film, has its place. It's good that you mentioned the, your ethical considerations because we all have a responsibility, of course, when we make films, especially documentary films, who very often are seen as the truth, which is, of course, bullshit. But um, um, we all have this responsibility. And um, how responsible are you about making films? Or maybe let's go a little bit more precisely, like we 
especially to, in terms of recreating stereotypes, for example, how aware are you or do we have to be a little bit more aware because we do queer films or political films? Do you, yeah, do you have to, do we have to be more responsible when it comes to such delicate topics as queer lives or political, um, li um, political topics? Do you get my question or, I mean, we bear this responsibility, but do we have to be aware, especially in terms of recreating stereotypes? Are you always aware, okay, what I'm doing now could be a stereotype or, or not? Yeah. Maybe, Eliane, you want to continue with that? Uh, I, I, no, I wanted to tell you that from the beginning, I don't consider the film to be objective. So we are in a different reality. We are in a reality where uh, there is a film, there is a protagonist, and uh, I have the power of the camera, uh, there is a crew, uh, the same things he would have told me in an intimate session would change because there is a crew and because uh, uh, there is an audience now listening. All this for me, uh, especially when you have somebody who is confessing, you know, he is exposing his life. So the, 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 the contradictional things, I put them in the film. So there's nothing called the truth. There's nothing called, uh, this is, I mean, even how Miguel sees his parents, let's say, because his parents are, uh, we talk about them a lot in the film. Maybe it's not the absolute truth. Maybe it's a point of view of somebody who saw his parents like this. Uh, 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 so, so we are, from the beginning, in a very personal relation uh, where we are seeing the film through his eyes. And I am also manipulating him sometimes because I want him to, like, see something which he is not seeing and he is manipulating me because he wants to be maybe loved in this moment. He wants the audience to love him. It's a whole, it's a playful film. And uh, exposing this to the audience makes it honest. Like when Orson Welles say, uh, you know, you have to lie in, in this film called F for Fake. You have to lie to reach the truth. This is exactly what I tried to do in this film, like these multi-layers are, is, you are in the head of Miguel, which is totally like layered, 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 and we are playing with lies and fake and true and archive and reality and how you see life in one uh, angle. And, uh, and this experience, I'm trying to put it to the audience. Uh, so that everyone lives this experience and has his own conclusion mm -hmm. about life. Mm -hmm. I think that's the very important part in your film anyhow, so that you reflect your role as a filmmaker and also about subjectivity and about the manipulative way or like the manipulation you constantly do in a film, especially in a documentary film where everybody thinks that is truth, but I mean like every frame every decision for a framing is already kind of like leaving most of the part outside. Coming then to the editing room, like contextualizing one thing after the other gives like another aspect. So it's always manipulative. So we, we are all aware about the manipulative character of our work, maybe a bit less in, in fiction films, but um, still we are constantly manipulating. Um, coming back maybe to history, um, I outed myself already that I I was totally, um, or my life was, I don't want to sound too dramatic, but Virgin Machine was kind of like life-changing in terms of my kinematographic life, let's say. Um, Milica, do you remember a film from the past, a queer film that kind of like also influenced your work? Could you say that? Or don't you remember? Or or that kind of like showed you another vision on queer lives, queer characters? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but, mm, I, I don't know if it changed the way uh, or influenced me, but I know the movies that I liked. And um, I remember when I watched uh, Fucking Omol. This is the, the, the movie that I... I really, really liked, and 
Hedwig also. But oh, um, maybe it, maybe short bus was something that uh, kind of changed uh, perspective of uh, relationships and uh, and uh, and love. Maybe maybe short bus I can say now, but not on uh, movie making on on life. It, it just changed a bit perspective on life. I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because for movie making, it's it's a really you know I have it's a big question. I would really have to think a, a lot of it, uh, a lot about it to to answer it frankly. That what what movie influenced me the most? Or sorry for not answering the questions correctly, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is it. No, sorry. Thanks. Nothing called correctly or not. <laughs> When I was growing up, actually, there was um, hardly any uh, queer films out. I mean, I'm a little older than you guys are. And I guess um, what qualified um, as a movie which kind of changed my life was a movie like Repulsion. Um, and I fell in love with Catherine Deneuve <laughs> at the time. Uh, so, I, you know, it was really much less out there in the um, 60s or so and um, well I had to look for for other inspirations in those days but I guess um, what was really important for me in terms of documentaries about queer history was um, a movie by Lizzie Borden um, Born in Flames really opened my eyes from the early 80s and another queer documentary I really find totally educational is um, Before Stonewall by uh, Greta Schiller. Um, so there is, I mean, we are so lucky now, I guess, since the 80s and 90s, we have so much more um, movies to watch and to enjoy and movies to inspire us than we had in for, you know, the earlier generations. So we always had to go back to classical straight films and fall in love with, um, you know, the, in my case, the female protagonist or the, the boys, they fell in love with the, um, you know, the other guys, the straight guys in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for mentioning Repulsion, which is also one of my favorites. Anyhow, um, talking about your films, which are also kind of like part of the, queer narrative already, um, Virgin Machine, My Father is Coming, compared to your documentary films that obviously, or like in the first hand, seem to be a bit more a document for reality. But how do you see the historical value of your fiction films like Virgin Machine and, um, and My Father is Coming, um, films that are shot on original clubs probably, um, how do you see that in terms of historical value? Um, well, when I think of my father is coming, it's really amazing. You see gentrification right there. You see New York, the East Village looked so different back then when we shot the film. Um, I think we shot it in, in 1990. Um, the, uh, the East Village looked like... Um, a place where you had all kinds of uh, clubs and uh, you had also houses which were in bad shape. And now when you go to the East Village, it's all cleaned up there. It's all uh, apartment houses. It's all chain stores. The A lot of the old beautiful places where we went to eat like Vazelka's and you know the cheap little Italian cafes they're all gone now you have uh, Gap and uh, whatever you know all these creepy uh, chain stores and big restaurants um, so you know in terms of architecture um, I find the, the older films which were shot in cities like New York or San Francisco really show us what has gone, what's gone now. But I don't want to just uh, stay, you know, be standing on the standpoint of nostalgia. So I'm not really saying, okay, 
you know, when you, when we look back in, in the 80s, the 70s or early 90s, it was so beautiful back then. It was different. And especially for queer scenes, um, I, I guess what is really, yeah, when I feel nostalgic, the only really big thing I feel nostalgic about is that we don't have locations anymore. Locations um, in, in New York or San Francisco, or I mean Berlin or Hamburg. We used to have uh, three lesbian bars in, in Hamburg or four or five at one point. So they're all gone. And that's the same story pretty much all over the Western world, pretty much. You know, we don't have places. We lost our places. So, okay. Sorry, I went back No, 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 that's true. And, um, and I, mean, I have to admit, I'm very nostalgic, nostalgic very often as well. And um, especially when it comes to places as well. Um, and we don't have those places anymore, but we have um, archives, we have festivals, we have places where we show films, at least. So um, we are all aware about the importance of it. And I mentioned, and I'm very curious, that's why I'm heading to this um, topic as well, um, Elian, um, that you tell us a little bit about um, Beirut DC and also about DP and also about the Fuat Festival. Uh, which is, I think, a new festival. And also, I think, Monica, you were quite interested in hearing a little bit about about mm. this festival. Can you give us a little insight? And also, whether you have or not um, archives connected to the festival, if you so show retrospectives, some some information about this festival, please. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, well, the Beirut DC is an association for cinema that we created in uh, 1999. Uh, especially to uh, to have uh, the, the image of uh, our uh, so societies being represented because we always felt that uh, films, uh, Arab films, uh, that were all the TV films were not at all uh, showing uh, our lives. Uh, so we started with this association and then we it became bigger, it became bigger and uh, we made festivals, uh, Cinema Days of Beirut is a big, like, uh, uh, not big, but let's say a recognized festival and that everybody likes because we really try to show the new Arab uh, wave of, of films and we debate a lot. We, uh, it's a filmmakers festival, not a producers or a distributor festival. So it really has an intimate relation with filmmakers. Uh, and uh, lately, in 2017, uh, we, we created Cinema Al Fouad. Uh, it was a small section within Cinema Days of Beirut. And then it became a, a festival uh, by itself in 2019. Uh, cinema Al Fouad uh, means the cinema of the heart. Fouad is heart. In the same time, Fouad is the name of a guy, uh, a man. You know, so it really links in the same time love to somebody, you know, a guy called Fuad. And it's the name of the, uh, one of the first queer films that have been made in the 80s uh, in Lebanon by uh, Mohammed Swed, who is a pioneer in that sense. It's called Cinema Al Fuad. He made a film about uh, a, a movie theater called Cinema Al Fuad, uh, where uh, the main protagonist, uh, he was a man, but he wanted to be a woman, uh, uh, would go and watch films. And he had uh, a love uh, relation with one of the militia guys. So it's an iconic film in our uh, queer history in Lebanon. And uh, we wanted to, to pay a tribute to Muhammad Swed. This is why we called the festival Cinema Al Fuad. In the same time, it's about love. So it really brings back uh, the sexual identity or whatever to love, uh, which here we tend to forget when uh, in the society you label, of course, not, not us, but the mainstream labels homosexuals, it's always bad people or people who, who are not complete, who are like uh, sick somehow, and we need to uh, cure them. This is how they are looked uh, in the, in the wider sense. So bringing back sexual identity to love 
it was for us a way to start uh, at least bringing the audience to, to watch films about love, but love within different sexual identities. It's always about love, about loving yourself, loving others, having relationships. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's the first festival of its kind in Lebanon. And the region doesn't have a lot of festivals about queer uh, people. There's only one in Tunisia. Uh, so uh, we try to highlight a lot Arab queer films, especially that in the last, uh, let's say, five, six years, the new generation is more comfortable to, of filmmakers is more, uh, easy, you know, like comfortable to talk about their sexual identity. So we have now a bunch of queer films. Uh, some of them were my students. I'm very uh, uh, like honored to have uh, two or three of my students, Salim Rad, Anthony, Shidya, uh, who now have films everywhere. Uh, 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 they go to festivals and uh, uh, I feel that also as a teacher, uh, because I teach, I, I learned a lot through this young generation of uh, uh, boys and girls who uh, want to talk about their sexual identity. And uh, luckily that I helped a little bit the university to open for them these uh, like platforms to really talk about their stories. So now we have films uh, uh, that are coming from this generation, from the Arab world, and uh, we try to highlight them in Cinema al Fouad. This year also we created a grant for them to support these films. Of course, we are talking on a very small level, but I believe it will, it will grow. Mm -hmm. So we're trying, you know. <laughs> Talking about teaching, Monica, you also teach. Um, I also teach queer history, uh, queer film history. Um, in general, teaching. How do? How much do you see your way of teaching also as something as sharing? I remember we had this film generation generations some years ago by Barbara Hammer, where she handed a Super 8 or 60 millimeter camera to to um, a younger filmmaker as kind of like an introduction, as kind of like a, um, initiation for filmmaking. How much do you see in your way of teaching also sharing and giving as an aspect of, of your teaching concept? Oh, I feel the same like uh, Eliane. Um, I'm very proud when um, the younger generation is starting to do their own work. And I see my my role pretty much as the role of um, a midwife, really. <laughs> so I'm trying to get um, to uh, free their creativity and their fantasies. And I just try to support them in making um, their mostly short films, really. Um, so that's what I enjoy the most to uh, work in practical filmmaking and supporting uh, the students uh, each step along the way. And the most important thing I believe is to take away fear um, because I think the whole university system in Germany, for example, is all based on that students are, are fearful of, um, you know, their whatever, uh, the end of their studies, they are pressured, especially right now, they are totally pressured with the COVID uh, crisis. So I really want for them to explore fun and joy and to really free their fantasies and help them to get their short films made. That's basically it. Thanks. Um, we have already some questions from the audience. Um, um, there is Matthew asking, what do you each see as the biggest opportunities and challenges right now facing the creation of queer films? Maybe Milica, do you, did you understand the question or does it touch no, you somehow? Please, please repeat me, so, sorry. What do you see as the biggest opportunities and challenges right now facing the creation of queer films? I mean, your film is not necessarily a queer film, but yeah. you, you are a queer filmmaker and you, you raise topics like this. What, is, what do you see as a big challenge in making films or having the opportunity uh -huh. to make films? 
Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, making uh, queer films is a is a challenge. I think uh, making films is a challenge. <laughs> and I don't know. So true. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know when I'm gonna do the next one. So I think this is, I don't know. And even now, it's even harder, as Eliana said. I mean, with this uh, online. Uh, platform or festivals when you don't have even opportunity to show it to people. I mean, people will watch it, but we don't know who are these people. You cannot feel them or, I mean, it's not like I go to audience and feel them, but, you know, just sit behind and feel uh, how they're breathing the movie, if they like it or don't like it, you know. So... This is the, the biggest problem now for me, actually. Uh, what are we doing now? Who, who, who is going to watch it? Um, is there any sense? So I'm a bit in an, uh, some negative phase, actually. But of course, uh, then I catch myself watching the movies. <laughs> and then you see, oh, yeah, so people still love it. But I think that sharing, uh, experience of sharing the movie is something that we really loved from the beginning when we sat at the, that theater and and i'm a bit afraid that this this is something we're going to lose but also no we're not but this is a period of time that um it's uh i'm not very optimistic but maybe it's, it's a part of the day the sun is kind of mm. Mm. No, I totally agree. Or um, I share your worries as well. Um, but I'm very optimistic, or I'm trying to be optimistic that we have those festivals, that we have places to show. And I mean, we are not making films only to just like make them. We want to see the reactions, and this is what um, festivals are made for. And you cannot see the reactions on uh, an, a Netflix screening or whatever. You know, nothing against yeah. Netflix, but we need those places not only for seeing rea reactions from the audience, but also for networking and mingling and um, smoking a thousand cigarettes in a very small room. I mean, those That's are really very, true. very important things. And um, yes. I have so many uh, countless um, examples where not uh, on panels or but outside the screenings, later on parties, people got together and f made films together. So th this is so important. And um, I cannot repeat often enough how much I hate not seeing you, not touching you, not not being with you right now. Um, but I'm very optimistic that we will see each other in June um, in Berlin for a summer Berlinale, which is incredible, or yeah. which could be much fun. And um, I'm sure, or I really, really hope um, that we will see each other here again, because I have many, many more questions and maybe even more intimate questions that I wouldn't ask right now on a panel. But let's see, we have more questions here from the audience. Um, John asks, a lot of queer history has been erased. We have so many empowering stories which haven't been told. What would it take to get these kind of stories produced and to reach a mainstream audience and being marketable, marketable um, leading to distribution, distributors, probably, if I understand the question correct. So um, the question is, what would it take to get these kind of stories produced? And to reach a mainstream audience, okay, maybe the role of a producer, like um, how difficult is it to find producers to finance your films that are still kind of like seen as niche films or did it, was it very difficult to convince producers or to find producers? Maybe again, Milizia, maybe you want to start with that or whoever wants to say something. Well, I didn't have uh, I didn't have to convince anybody because uh, I already was. We have a uh, different ways of funding. So, uh, Film Center Serbia funded this uh, movie, and we got uh, we got the budget right away as soon as I wrote the script. Uh, it went to I don't know to a commission, and they liked it. They vote for it. So, but for example. Uh, uh, transition when I uh, when I uh, was making transition I wrote it in uh, 2013 and then I needed like uh, two years to get funded it, it was a bit tricky so I had to 
we we couldn't uh, get the funds for it and then finally after two years we, we got yeah so that but it's it's a different kind of a way uh, we we have just one fund in our country so you have to just wait for it so you get the best like uh, commission to to read your script and to find the potential in it so it's a it, it was a bit tricky in that that mm -hmm. sort of way i don't know Monica, you you are experienced with film fundings um, since a long time already. Um, do you think, or is it easier now, or even more difficult to get fundings compared to, let's say, 20, 30 years ago? Well, unfortunately, I know quite a bit about the funding body <laughs> in Germany because I'm my own producer. Most of the times, I was I've been my own producer because I'm very impatient sometimes when you have a bigger production company and it doesn't move on. So then I just rather would produce the films myself. But what you are asking, I think it's um, right now the, the times, is, I mean, in Germany are not so grim anymore. We have, for example, the Queer Media Society. They're doing quite some, um, you know, valuable work. Um, so mainstream Germany is more open than ever before, I believe, for queer subjects, queer documentaries, queer fiction films, and more and more producers are open for it. So um, to answer the question for, I think his name was John, if he's interested in seeing more or making uh, queer films inside of Germany, maybe, um, I think there are a lot of open doors right now. So I'm quite happy about the changing of the times. Um, John is also asking you, Monica, he's asked, I haven't heard of Gender Notes before, but I was moved watching the trailer to Generation just now. Which should I watch first? <laughs> well, if you stay in inside the chronological order, I guess I, <laughs> I would recommend to watch Gender Notes first and then Generation. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, or Yeah. Coming a little bit to the future, because like in the introduction text, we also wrote about, or like we mentioned that also the future is a topic, this, or like queer future is a topic. Um, what I found very interesting in your film, Monica, is that I think, is it Sandy mentioning that she and other trans people are growing into their identity, right? So it's a process of growing into the identity. It's not, Oh, that's what well, that was very moving it's also kind of like the queer movement it's in a constant flux right so the acceptance fight for marriage or like like all now it's kind of like becoming all heteronormativity so trans has to become the new queer or whatever but do you think there there is a shift towards new different fields of activism that is also part in your film i think is it part in your film or in the the film that is about Annie Sprinkle and Beth, um, where she says like nature or like activism or like the, the, not the gender, but the role of human being in the time of the Anthropocene is more important. It's, it's, it's not the individual gender fight. It's more like we have to give nature um, a, f um, a voice. Do you see, or like question to all of you maybe, do you see a shift of uh, the need or the urge of activism. It's maybe well, if, I'm, if I may, uh, yeah, Anna, please, Monica. First, um, I think what uh, Susan Stryker, who is a gender a theorist and also an activist, a trans politics activist, uh, she says something really important. She says the time has come that we should not fight over. Um, each other or fight just for our different identities. The times now with climate crisis, with uh, the gap between rich and poor um, and, you know, new dictatorships popping up here and there, pre-fascist climates. Um, I think we have a much bigger enemy as queer people these days. And this is some kind of a message I try to convey in this film. It's also, um, you know, Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens 
Um, they are uh, climate activists and uh, activists for really protecting the earth. We only have one earth. And so they try to combine sexual freedom, sexual um, pleasure with protecting the earth. So that's kind of a new queer movement called ecosexuality. So I'm quite uh, fascinated by this and it's part of the film. So we see new forms of political activism, which is less about defining our own small group ident sexual identity, but it's, it's um, more uh, encompassing um, the, the problems we are just of our times we live in right now. Mm -hmm. Good that you're mentioning eco-sexuality. Also, there's a new movement of eco-porn, which is um, interesting to see. and. Um, What I've loved um, about the act or like the activism about um, um, Annie and Beth is also that they that on the LGBTQ there is another um, <laughs> another N added for nature. So that is that is quite interesting. Maybe Eliane may talking about or like in Beirut. Of course, I don't. There is the big liberation. The, hottest queer parties and everything but still of course you have to face other things um how do you see the struggle or new challenges as well for activism do you, would you agree that we don't have to fight that much any longer for queer rights but more for nature how do you see that uh the problem first of all is that we are way behind uh Monica's characters, or I don't know, Serbia, the, 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 I mean, how is the situation of LGBT people there? But here we are really very, very far. I mean, we are not even, uh, the, 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 the queer people don't have any rights. They are still, as I said, being considered as sick people. Uh, the laws are very backward for them. Sometimes they find themselves in prisons. So. It's true that we have a, an underground movement that uh, is like uh, maybe better than Arab countries around us uh, in the sense that you can uh, see gays in the streets sometimes. They have their own uh, places. Uh, they can do sometimes films, but uh, not on a big level, not on a wide level, uh, wider level. It's, it stays in, you know, elite, elitist uh, 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 ambiance that accepts them. Uh, so we are way behind like to, and, and in the same time, we have, we are overwhelmed with, you know, the situation we are living in Lebanon. I cannot describe it. It's beyond uh, everything you can imagine. Uh, uh, militia was asking me, why do we have power cuts? Now I can, maybe in five minutes, I will have a power cut. You will not see me again. We are so much in a corrupted state that uh, uh, we, we, we don't have any vision for tomorrow. The, the country totally collapsed in 2019. We started a revolution uh, against corruption. But it led to, uh, you know, the politicians being even worse than before and taking over and because they feel that it's the end for them, but they are becoming even more fierce. So they are oppressing everyone now. Everyone who is uh, revolting, who is asking for anything uh, to make his life better, who's asking for you know, uh, e equality for justice, for economical, uh, you know, uh, he, the, the, the many people now are in jail because they are fighting for their basic rights. So fighting for sexual identity, of course, now is not, is not the time because like it's really behind, uh, uh, you know, it, like it's, it, it's like you, now you are saying, I want to make cinema, you know, in COVID, I want to make cinema. How much do they find it unnecessary at this moment? Uh, it's the same, like you want to say now uh, uh, LGBT right in Lebanon, they will say this is not necessary at the moment because like how I'm gonna eat tomorrow. This is like 
that that much we are uh, uh, like way behind uh, struggling for any uh, progressive idea at the moment. Uh, but still, if um, I want to talk about like many gays are or, or lesbians are are activists also on a social level. They are with the revolution. So we expected this revolution. Uh, that started in 2019 that is oppressed at the moment, but we think that it will rise again later. Uh, uh, it will carry all the justice we want. And the so sexual identity or being queer is one of them. But it's not like that it and, and the others are, are, are not there. It's, it's, it, it's a whole. In the same time, you know, it's a big picture. Like, uh, how do you want to be progressive in all the senses in the laws for women in the you know everything that we want to carry as a, a good values in this life as something nice the climate of course but we are also way behind the climate fights that are that exist in 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 usa uh, here we are we are really like uh, very very uh, you know behind what's happening so mm. uh, of course we want this, but I don't know when it will happen. And uh, I feel that it's a whole thing that should really carry all this wave of, 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 uh, of revolution. Uh, and, and by the way, when the Arab Spring started in, in 2000, like 10 years ago, it carried a lot of values about women rights, about gays rights. It was a, 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 a very good uh, atmosphere for everything. Uh, uh, but also because it was oppressed in such a bad way everywhere and uh, it's either the military or the Islamists that took over uh, uh, any struggle. So these values are now like, you know, uh, women, women values or women law, changing the laws or, 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 or changing the LGBT situation is now really repressed. It's somewhere, you know, I don't know where, but it's there. I mean, I hope it will, it will come, come, come again, you know, now it will come back again, but I don't know when. Yeah. And I mean, the more important it is that we can meet in person again and that we can gather and that we can have discussions among each others and not via um, Zoom or whatever, because <laughs> nobody knows who will listen, who listens as well. But that is important. Um, also for activism in your case, I think, um, and th that's why let's hope that, that this shit is over anyhow very soon. Uh, Milica, I have a question um, because you are probably the youngest as well. And in your film, your film is not a, let's say, queer film. It's not the main topic, right? It's more like about relationships. Um, how far do you see this as a, as a way of just like linking queer topics in a, in a let's say, normal action of a film or like how 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 do you see that and 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 is it so important to still make queer films or like films that deal with only queer topics yes i think uh, i mean every every film that you make uh, and you have something to say i think it's important to be made actually so of course any topics that 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 is dealt with love and uh, and that you thought it's true is uh, worth seeing and worth making it right sorry i have to go for a charger but i'm gonna <laughs> sorry so um what i wanted to say uh regarding the queer characters uh, in, in the movie um sorry again this is my colleague, but I didn't want to interrupt our interview. Ah, oh, sorry. So, um, I think what was important for me uh, was to actually represent, uh, yeah, rep relationships that I know so well, uh, people that I know so well in their most ugliest way and the most lovable way. So I never, so I never, um, the, the, the main thing isn't, isn't being queer or not queer gay or not gay. It's, 
it's about uh, it's about uh, I don't know it's it's about people who I love and who sometimes annoys me and sometimes I love when they annoy me and sometimes I just want to kill them and <laughs> sometimes they are queer and sometimes they are not sometimes they are they are trans and sometimes they are Romani sometimes I don't know you know sometimes they are older sometimes they are younger yeah I, I no yeah. let's sum it up it's love that counts actually that's true and um, I see we have 10 minutes more um, of course I want to go into the future as well and um, I was wondering about my own films that have been produced like many years ago as well um, how will they be seen and I always think or I always hope that maybe people in let's say like 20 30 40 years make fun about it saying like oh look they were still kind of like gay and lesbian or lgbtq what a funny term what a funny phenomenon how do you see your films in let's say 30 years from now or what would you wish probably how the audience or scholars or film historians would talk about your films monica maybe we can start with you because you have like a little bit this experience as well because your films are already taught in um, queer film history classes I have to admit I do it myself too um, how would you see your films or gender nods uh, 2050 I'd say <laughs> I have to laugh I'm, I'm such a realist uh, I can only you know if I would have a magic ball now to look into, I might um, have get an idea, but um, on the other hand, in 30 years from now, what's going to be? What's, uh, I have no clue. Maybe people just, um, just don't go to the cinemas anymore. The cinemas will turn into museums, uh, film museums. So we have just maybe Uh, very few of them and um, everything else is is streamed and it's more mainstream and well I have no clue and um, of course I wish for our films to be uh, to still be seen but um, you know I mean uh, uh, the viewing experience is changing so much Uh, how young people watch movies these days. I see it when I talk to my students. They, Most of them can't even watch uh, anything which is longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> They say, oh, I have to watch a 90-minute film. It's impossible. So um, people watch films on tiny screens. Um, well, who knows? Maybe we are in the last years of anything like uh, the cinema experience. Maybe we are just uh, crazy older people who wish for the cinema experience to last. Who knows? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No answer here. <laughs> oh my God, don't be so pessimistic. I, I cry. <laughs> so, uh, Miritia and um, Elian, do you have ideas about how your films should be seen or um, discussed? Or, or do you think, like, do, you, do your films kind of like change something for the future? Or what would you wish that your films would change for the future? Uh, if I have to answer, I ask myself, why did I make film, first of all? Uh, I think one of the reasons why I make especially documentary films is that I wanted to be an active human being and try to portray stories that would create a debate or would complete uh, uh, things which we do not have in Lebanon like the history of our country in, in, in the last 30 years is not written. Uh, uh, the, the, the story of the civil war is not written uh, because uh, of the amnesty that happened after the war. Uh, uh, and we found like one of our duties was to tell experiences from the war through people that we would film They will tell their stories. And then maybe after, if somebody wants to have a, 
an overall picture of what happened in the civil war, he would take those films, for example, watch them and try to understand, make his own uh, conclusion about it. So part of why we make documentary films, uh, for me uh, as a citizen now, I'm saying not only as a filmmaker, is to try to tell stories which are not told uh, by our state or by our historians for many reasons. And uh, also try to uh, highlight individual stories because we are always considered as numbers. Uh, especially when the West look at the Arab world, it's always the Arab world. Uh, although we are many countries and we uh, speak different dialects or languages, uh, and we have a uh, lot of ethnicity, ethnicity uh, and, and we have uh, many religions and we have uh, many, we, we, were, we are so diverse, but all the politics that happened in the last years made that we became a number. Uh, just, you know, the Arab world, uh, with all the stereotypes, well, they are all Muslims, they are now all terrorists or they are whatever. Uh, uh, do. Sometimes when I go to festivals, I explain, you know, I become somebody who explains uh, history, which I don't like because like I'm a filmmaker, so I would like to talk cinema. But because many people don't know, so they start asking, you know, like, uh, how is it to be a woman in the Arab world? Or, you know, things which I find it like, okay, weird, if you want to know, well, go Google and you will know how women live in the Arab world. <laughs> Why do I have to answer this question? I came with a film. Talk about my film and maybe we can talk about also, uh, you know, filmmaking or whatever. I always have to fill a gap, I feel, of how the West understands this region. Uh, uh, so uh, in that sense, yeah, writing uh, uh, stories or uh, making films was also to mark that we are individuals, we have personal experiences, look at us as personal experiences, as private, as individual, look at our diversity. We are not one Arab world, you know, big bulk is uh, equal Arab world. Uh, uh, so I had uh, like responsibility in that sense. This is why also I made films. I also made films because my grandfather used to have a uh, cinema uh, in the 50s, you know, a movie theater where I saw all the films. I saw Chaplin, I saw Egyptian melodramas. And really it saved me, C cinema mm -hmm. saved me. Cinema experience, when I was uh, uh, frightened in, in, uh, in my childhood, when I was feeling lonely, when I uh, was like having emotional problems, Cinema saved me. So I also wanted to uh, pay a tribute to cinema because it saved me. I would like to give this magic moment to somebody else who's seeing, you know, a story in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cinema, in a movie theater. And this is why I am very sad if it disappears. Uh, I am also pessimistic, unfortunately, like Monica, but for because of many, many other things, many levels, uh, many, like, also I'm uh, sad about my country, so how can I even think about filmmaking? I feel that this is the last film I will do, because I don't know tomorrow what will happen. It's also also unstable for me at the moment, that I feel that at least I made films. These films uh, uh, exist somewhere. People, some people saw them, some academic people wrote about them. So yeah, maybe they will have a life which I will not control. They exist somewhere. I'm happy that I was able to do them. I don't know what will happen in the future. Hopefully, we will be again in a cinema uh, and everything will, will, will be brighter. But at the moment, really, it's not a bright I, I, <laughs> I totally see what you mean, and but it's good <laughs> that you mentioned that we can... Monica, you want to say something? Or? Yeah, just... Yes, um, please. I hate it uh, that we are so separated here. I've, I'm very emotionally touched by what you just said, Ellen. And I would love to hug you right now. So please feel hugged, <laughs> virtually hugged right now. 
yeah that's actually so, that's <laughs> actually the same thing i also wanted to say to you that um i just can't wait to have you here soon that we can discuss the films in detail in front of an audience and let's not stop continue making films and if the concentration span of kind of like younger generations is only 15 minutes we just have to cut the films in little portions and call it a series <laughs> so then the films will also be seen so please 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 feel hugged um physically i let please can you switch the camera i just see some flowers here that i'm giving you oh, la, girls. La. <laughs> please <laughs> mwah, mwah, feel hugged and kissed <laughs> and and see you very 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 soon in june and june 20th is my birthday so then we're going to celebrate this oh, as well okay la, la. Okay. Thanks for being here yeah. or like being present and for having discussed those topics. That was very, very interesting. I hope not only for me, also for you and the audience. Um, no, this camera is not on. Um, please, can you switch to this camera? Um, um, no, you're not. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Malica. And thanks, El Eliane, for, for joining. And all the very best. And um, yeah, feel physically hugged. I hope I see you guys in June. Bye. Bye bye. Awesome. Bye bye. Ciao. bye, -bye. Thank Ciao. you. Thank bye. You. Thanks. Thanks, Kiki.